you everyone for coming. I um, just wanted to thank uh, Kaylee's for hosting us. And this is Jack. Uh, he started Leo in 2007. Um, and since then, he's grown the company from two employees to over 80, I think, right? Right. Uh, so we're here to talk today about a little bit about that challenge, that journey, how you got to where you are now, and, uh, and some of the things that we can do to follow that journey as well. All right, sounds great. Cool. So where did you go to school? Uh, so I, I went to school in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, the, uh, my co-founder and I, my co-founder is Ryan Govro, and he and I actually met in uh, elementary school in, in Edmonton and uh, went through junior high and high school together, became uh, fast friends. He, he came out uh, to BC to do his bachelor's degree, uh, and I stayed in Edmonton and went to the University of Alberta to do my bachelor's degree, and then I uh, stayed in school, did my master's degree in computer science, and uh, moved out here about two and a half years ago. Awesome, and I'm actually gonna turn this microphone off. Oh, I guess it's not the microphone. All right, well, I apologize for that. That's okay. okay. Let's continue. So what did you do after you graduated? So when I graduated from my uh, bachelor's degree, I joined a startup that was a University of Alberta spin-off called, uh, called Kenomis, and they were doing a life sciences company, a startup that did medical diagnostic software, and I, um, I decided I would, you know, jump in and get involved in a startup because a startup excited me, and startups probably excite all of you guys as well. So I thought this was a great first gig after uh, doing my bachelor's degree. The interesting thing about Konomics is they were actually solving these really kind of deep computer science problems with numerical analysis um, and uh, machine learning type problems, and, and I decided that. I'd actually like to learn more about this field in particular. I decided after working for about a year to go back and do my master's degree. Okay, so then you went back and did that? Yeah, I went back and did my master's degree. It took another couple of years at the same school at the U of A. And then I uh, uh, rejoined the same company, Konomics, uh, right after I, I finished my master's degree and kind of walked back in and said, I know a whole bunch of new stuff now. And they, uh, they, they promoted me into a, a position where I was the director of product development uh, and basically running the, the product development organization for the company. And at the time I'd been in school, it had grown from uh, what it was when I left it, which was basically four people, uh, to a group of about 30 people. So I was running about half the company that was product development and uh, stayed in that job for about three years before jumping into Clio. Okay, so what, how did that happen? You and Ryan were still friends, obviously. And yeah, so Ryan and I were still friends and we um, we always wanted to build a, a company together. We were always excited by the concept of doing a startup and running a company. And, uh, uh, you know, we daydreamed about all these all these ideas when we were, we were in elementary school and junior high and high school together. Uh, you know, when we were, I remember in elementary school, one of the ideas we were excited about was uh, starting an aerospace engineering company, and we realized that that was a pretty capital-intensive uh, venture. And there's only like two two schools in Canada that graduate or uh, uh, grant uh, aerospace engineering diplomas. So we said, well, that's not so practical. Let's keep our eye out for something a little bit more practical. Um, Brian went through his undergrad degree at SFU here. Uh, he did a degree in. Uh, kinesiology, which I think he, you know, realized pretty quickly was uh, it's not all that useful, um, and so he went back to school and started working on an MBA. And um, I was at Economics and completely happy in my job at Economics. And on the side, Ryan and I had been doing some consulting work with the Law Society of British Columbia, and the Law Society had identified um, the fact that there was this really big pain point with solos and small firms where. They just found it extremely challenging to stay on top of their practice and not run into malpractice-related issues. And we, we just said, you know, this this looks like a great problem domain. This looks like a great area for us to uh, to develop a product and decided to jump into it, you know, with both feet. Cool. So you guys were working on it on the side? That's yeah, cool. that's right. So we started off, you know, really not sure where it was going to go at all worked on it on the side and just, you know, jumped right into it. 
Um, when did you take that leap of faith from leaving? Uh, it was probably about six months, um, six months to a year of time where we worked on things like a, uh, like a business plan, fleshed out the, um, the market research, built an alpha version of the program. And what I was really excited about at the time was at Konomics I had started off doing coding, like as a software developer by trade, and um, you know, had gone to school to learn, you know, all this all this great software development stuff and, and machine learning stuff that I learned in my master's degree. And I felt like when I rejoined Konomics, it was great being in a leadership position, but I missed being hands-on with product development. I missed actually writing code. So when we started writing, when, when Ryan and I decided to start pursuing the video as an idea, um, we just decided we'll, we'll code it ourselves, we'll code it on the side. And it was really great for me to kind of pick up the, the keyboard again and start coding because I've gotten so, so far away from it. Were you the one that coded all of it or did Ryan also have that background? So Ryan didn't have a computing science background, but he picked up what he needed to to kind of like hack his way through it. <laughs> so um, I. I did the majority of the coding, and Ryan did a, a, a substantial amount of the coding as well. And we we developed you know, pretty much the entire thing ourselves, version 1.0. Um, so Nalia here is actually one of our software developers now, and he occasionally runs across some of our code and probably curses us. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's code in particular, yeah. <laughs> Who wrote this stuff? But yeah, there's still chunks of the code the code base that uh, uh, were written by by Ryan and I, um, and I, I think that's. Um, you know, I'd encourage anyone that's at a, at a juncture where they're choosing what to pursue in school, I, I do really think that computing science is such a great, a great basic skill set to, to build, no matter what discipline you end up going into, whether you're going into, you know, engineering or business or uh, maybe you want to do a startup, uh, it's, it's such an amazing skill set to have at your disposal. Would you say you were the technical co-founder of that relationship there? Um, a lot of people see you as the business founder. Yeah, yeah. No, that's an interesting question. I've never really thought about it that way. I think Ryan and I were, um, in many ways, splitting responsibilities pretty, pretty equally, especially at the outset. Where, when we were, when we were really small, it was just the two, two of us working on Cleo's split right down the middle, we were both committing code, we were both um, working on the business side of things, developing the strategy for the company. So I wouldn't really frame either of us as being, one of us being the biz guy and one of us being the, the technical guy. I think we were both technical. Um, I was a little bit more strong on the technical side just because of my, my training, but Ryan picked up everything he had to just on the side. So I, I guess that's another example that if you don't have a computing science background, you can still, I think if you've got the interest, pick up all the software development skill sets you need, you know, by reading and, you know, lots of great tutorials up there now and just being enthusiastic, but that's what, that's what Ryan did. Um, so, so yeah, I've never thought about us being split in terms of technical co-founder, business co-founder. We, we really worked on everything together. And it was only once the company got to a size where we felt that it wasn't reasonable that both of us knew that ever. So there was a point where we realized there's enough things going on that we can no longer both know everything that's going on in the company and we can't necessarily consult each other on all key decisions. We've gotten to a point where we need to kind of draw a line down the company and decide here's what I'm going to focus on and here's what Ryan's going to focus on. So at the very beginning though we we said, you know, we have very, very similar, similar and very equivalent scopes of concern in the company. And at what point was that? Like, how many employees were you at at that point? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think we were probably about ten employees or so, where we kind of made that split. where we made that split. Yeah. Right. Just and, go back a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry. When you guys first made that jump from, you know, you were working and doing things on the side, and then you turned to this yeah, full time. Yeah. What do you think was the biggest like barrier to doing that for you, and how did you get past that? So there was, there's a lot of barriers. You know, it's difficult deciding to. So my job at Economics, I was getting paid a great salary. Uh, you know, I, I, I at that point I was married. We had a house. We had a mortgage. 
so at that point, you know, I already felt like we had a lot of responsibilities. My wife, my wife wanted to have kids, and there's a lot of things I think that get in your your head saying, this isn't the right time right now. It'll be a better time later. You know, something will happen. We'll be more secure. We'll have a bit more of the mortgage paid off. We'll have a kid, and they'll be healthy, and it'll you know. They'll be in university and it'll be the same time to <laughs> start. I mean, I think that's the problem with the, you know, it'll be a better time later thinking is it never really gets to be a better time than than now. And I think, you know, for for Ryan and I, I was just realizing at one point that this thing is not going to ever have the traction that it needs to. It's never going to have the time investment it needs to truly succeed unless we we pull shoot and jump out of the plane and really start uh, investing time time in it. Because the reality is, is that you can only do so much on the side and you can only spend so many evenings and weekends working on something before you get pretty burned out and say, I need to take a shot at doing this full time. And I think we realized, you know, it was, it was time to make that bet about, uh, like I said, about a year or so after we built a business plan, started to build the alpha version of the product, we felt Okay, it's uh, it's time to, to do this. Did you do anything in your like personal life or even in your career life to compare for that, or was it just kind of like let's do it and we jump ship? No, I probably should have done more to prepare, but um, I, I, I just uh, decided that it was uh, it was time. You know, walked into my boss's office at, at Konomics and let him know what I was doing, and I'd actually been transparent with him about the fact that I was. You know, uh, working on this side project and hoped that it would be something I could do full time down the road. And you know, you just said, "Great, I, I hope it doesn't work out." But <laughs> we'd like to keep you. But um, I, I, he, he respected that. So I think he was disappointed when I decided to, um, you know, to pull shoot. But um, yeah, I didn't do a whole lot to uh, to prepare other than I think you know we going into leaving our jobs full time, we started raising money and got, started getting interest from angel investors and so on, you know, so that we have some funds to fund the company primarily, but to pay ourselves, you know, at least a, a living wage. So that would be my next question. When did the funding start and when did you start going after that? So we had um, what you could argue is the worst, the worst timing possible when we went out to raise money. So we. Uh, we, we raised a small amount of friends and family money in 2007 when we got started with a venture to, you know, kind of pay the legal fees of starting up the company and pay, you know, uh, towards some marketing and uh, development efforts, uh, but really didn't start trying to raise a serious investment round until uh, 2008. And you all probably remember 2008. It was, you know, the nuclear. Winter in the finance industry, uh, there was there was the legitimate worry among investors that the economic system, as we know it, was going to collapse. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. It, it, it sounds you know funny in retrospect, but people were genuinely worried that they were watching the financial system as we know it collapse. Yeah. And it was very very difficult to raise money. And I went to uh, a whole bunch, you know, across. Alberta and British Columbia. I went to a whole bunch of the the angel forums. Um, I, I did the angel forum here in Vancouver, uh, the Vancouver Angel Forum, I think it's called. I did the Venture Alberta Angel Forums. We had, I think, an amazing pitch, an amazing business plan. Uh, I was told on several occasions that the pitch that we had developed for Clio was the best pitch deck that these investors had ever seen. But nobody got their checkbooks out. They were just terrified, um, they were just terrified. So I, I, I don't think, I could have walked in there with, um, well, I did walk in there with the best investment proposal they'd ever seen, and still they didn't write a check. So it was uh, a really demoralizing time to be trying to raise trying to raise money, and I, I'm so thankful <coughs> that our, our friends and family put enough money in to kind of keep the, the, the venture going at that point. It wasn't a large amount of money we raised, a total of $100,000 of friends and family money. When I was raising the friends and family money, you know, it was, none of them were large checks. We were collecting kind of like a $5,000 check here and a $10,000 check there. I remember telling my parents, they said they wanted to invest, and I 
I think they actually wanted to invest more than they did because I said, um, treat this money as if you're putting it in a trash can and lighting it on fire. You know, I, I don't want to be looking at you in, you know, at a future Thanksgiving where you can't afford a turkey um, because you invested like down the startup idea. In, invest money you can afford to lose and literally act as, you know, treat it as if you just lit it on fire. And they still uh, invested. Um, Ryan's parents invested, um, and we got a you know network of about ten or fifteen friends that that put some money in as well. So we were running on a pretty small tank of, of cash, but we were we were really scrappy. We were doing all the software development, which would have been the primary cost if you were outsourcing development. So we were able to really stretch those dollars far. Um, so back to the raising our Series A, we were just butting our heads against the, the wall, so frustrated that it was you know, so difficult to raise money and we were, um, we were just at, at our rope's end in terms of really not knowing where to go next in terms of uh, evaluate or in terms of, of raising the fund. And in, in what, I'm not a big believer in divine intervention, but I'm not sure how else to describe this. Ryan was really bored sitting on a call with one of our beta customers and I think they were just listing like a list of 10,000 features they wanted to see in the software. Ryan got bored, went to Gmail, or we were using Gmail for our Google Apps. We were hosting all of our, uh, our email um, and decides to check, I don't think anyone ever does this, decided to check his spam folder to see if there was anything interesting in there. This is how bored he was. So, uh, <laughs> He looks in the spam folder and sees an email from a guy named Christoph Jan saying, you know, interested in investing in Clio and clicks in and reads it and it's this guy, Christoph Jans from Germany. He was at a web.de email address um, and he sent this investment proposal saying, not an investment proposal, but saying he read about Clio on this completely obscure blog. The completely obscure blog was this friend of mine that I think felt sorry for us and gave us some <laughs> press coverage on, uh, on his blog, which was called Web 2.0 Central. Um, I think Christoph's you know, investment thesis basically was, or not investment thesis, but his investment strategy was not to read TechCrunch to figure out what's going on, because you're reading about it too late when it's on TechCrunch. Go and read you know, all the early stage investment blogs and turn over those, those rocks and see what you can find. So, Clio was one of those um, companies he found when he was reading Web 2.0 Central. Mentioned this in his email and just said, "I'd be, are you raising money? I'd be interested in discussing an investment. So I think the problem was this hit like every single checkbox on Gmail spam filter, right? It was, probably looked like a Nigerian scam, yeah. right? Like, it talks about investment, uh, it's from an overseas email address, um, you know, it, so I can see why I was sitting in the spam folder. And then the funny thing was, two weeks later, this is also sitting in the spam folder, um, there's a follow-up email from Kristoff saying, you know, I'm, I'm really interested if you guys could please follow up. You know, and that, not replying to his email too quickly probably actually you know, convinced him. Yeah. So one thing I've, I've learned over the last couple of years, especially if we've gotten a lot of inbound interest from venture capitalists is never act too interested to a prospective investor. So I was chatting with one of them that, you know, I finally took one of their calls where they'd left me like literally 60 voicemails and 50 emails. I said, this guy's tenacious enough, I'm gonna have a conversation with him. And he said, you know what, I, I never actually talk to companies that are too eager to pick up the phone. If you pick up on the first call, you're not busy enough. <laughs> I'm not going to invest. So, anyhow, back to Christoph. Ryan digs out this email, forwards it to me, and says, "I think this might be legit." Uh, so we follow up with Christoph. At this point, he's very early in his investing career, so he's invested in two companies as their first angel investor. Uh, one of them was Zendesk, which at that time you guys are probably familiar with Zendesk. Uh, Zendesk at that time was still in Denmark, and Christoph was the very first angel investor. In in Zendesk, and the, the other company was a company called Free Agent Central, uh, which is like a, a zero type company in England. And we, and then Clio was the third company he was interested in investing in, and we were uh, we were pretty amazed. We followed up with him. He turned out to be just a 
uh, an amazing guy, incredibly intelligent, uh, brought a lot of value to the table in terms of teaching us how to run a SaaS company, and uh, became our lead investor for our Series A. So we raised uh, about a million dollars in our Series A in 2008, um, thanks to this random inbound email from Germany. So I know that's not much in the way of advice. Uh, <laughs> check, your spam. Uh, check your spam. Check your spam. There's some advice there. So leave no rock unturned. You never know where that uh, investor is hiding. So and maybe even get your blog published on a super unknown. Yeah, you know what? Blog. Like, yeah, everyone's chasing after the tech crunches and hoping that Michael Arrington's going to interview them. And you know what? Like, yeah, get get press wherever you can because investors are reading and monitoring news sources that you might not anticipate. Oh, there's some good advice right there. There we go, we turned it into some advice. <laughs> so, and hope for a random event. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so is that when the real growth of the company started, after that investment? When did you hire your first employee? And, and yeah, so our, started after that? our very first employee uh, um, was uh, a software developer. Um, it was actually my brother. We launched the beta of Clio. My brother was doing his computer science degree at the time, and right away, Clio kind of exploded. It, it wasn't like we had a million users in the first week, but by our expectations, Clio exploded, and we realized that you know there was a lot of work to be done on the software. Uh, so we, Ryan and I, you know, we were working at my house one day, and we're like, "Hey Fraser, we're totally underwater here. Do you want a job?" <laughs> and uh, he said, "Sure, I'll." I'm interested. He didn't know Rails, which is what we were coding Leo in. Uh, had never really developed a web application, but said he'd be willing to give it a try. He learned Rails and is now still with us, one of our senior software developers, and you know a very talented Rails developer. So that was one of our first hires. Our second hire uh, was uh, our first customer support person. And I think one of the really good things that Ryan and I did over the first few years with or I should say maybe the first year and a half or two years, uh, he and I read every single customer support email that came in and replied to them. So I think there's a temptation with you know founders to kind of extract themselves from the front lines a little bit too early, you know, hire people to respond to support emails and so on. But I think it's a terrific way to stay plugged into what your customers are asking for to help you set product direction. So it was a lot of overhead and maybe, you know, we shouldn't have been answering emails two years in, but we, we did. We were, you know, and, and impressed customers too. They they get a reply from, you know, the, the CEO and they'd be like, Wow, I I wasn't expecting a reply from the CEO and we wouldn't tell them that there's only two people in the company. They probably thought they were much bigger than they were. Um, but we eventually hired a customer support person to um, to, to help out on support organization, uh, and you know it's one of the best hires we ever made as well. She's still with the company as well. Awesome. What do you think the biggest factor was in that exploded growth that you uh, say happened? So what helped catalyze it? Yeah, what um, was like, what happened? Why did that happen? What was the factor there? I think that a lot of it boils down to uh, good timing. The, the market was ready for a product like Leo. We were the first to market, so we were the very first web-based uh, time and billing and practice management application for, for lawyers, and there was a real pent-up demand for that, and as soon as we started gaining notoriety and getting some good press, uh, you know, we, we hit a real critical mass in terms of um, PR. We hired a PR agency to help build a bit of momentum around the, the brand and the awareness around cloud computing. And I think that was that was what helped tip us over the edge. And I think what most startups are most startups are kind of battling being completely unknown. You know, not being able to get your name out there, launching, expecting this huge influx of customers, and then just stalling out. And I think we were able to overcome that with I don't think there was any single thing we did that helped catalyze that growth, but I think the things we did do well were um, providing really excellent support, catalyzing our early customers into evangelists and getting a real nice, you know, um, domino effect of them bringing on five new customers for us and those five new customers bringing on 
another 25 new customers for us. And I think our customer base in general is just terrific at referring and recommending software. Um, you know, we we did a good job on the PR side, and we we tried to make the conversation about something other than just Clio. We, we tried to make the conversation bigger than here's a new product, but we tried to make the conversation around here's a new cloud product in the legal space, and it's the first cloud product in the legal space. And that spawned a whole discussion on its own. So I, I think the you know you. You're just trying to reach as many people as possible and get your name out there, and I think we did. We did this succeed in that in the uh, in the early days, and the funding helped with that in that it gave us the, the resources to invest in a bit of PR and uh, invest in making sure we had the resources to deliver really excellent customer support and, and so on. So PR and customer service were really big for you guys. Yeah, PR was was huge. We you know the, had a lot of free advertising and all of the trade magazines and blogs and so on just because people were interested in this in this space and kind of the the, the new idea that you could be hosting because for lawyers this is a big deal the idea that you're hosting your confidential client data in the cloud that's really um, a really hotly contested concept even now five years later but five years ago we had people coming up to us almost like trying to pick a fight saying there's no way that I'm ever going to store my data in the cloud and I don't think any lawyer should and they, they just get in this um, argument mode and, and and we just you know benefited from that because any conversation is a good conversation in the, in the PR world. Great and then uh, so your company really started growing after that right how did you handle growing you said that you guys ended up splitting kind of some of the responsibilities but it did grow really fast, and you, you were the one to manage most of that, right? How did you find that? Yeah, so, you know, we've grown, you know, over the course of the last four years. Uh, four years ago, we were about four people, and we're about 80 people today. And it's been a, a pretty rapid period of expansion. And, and even just two and a half years ago, we were 11 people. So the growth over that, over that first you know, a couple of years was relatively slow compared to what we've seen in the last um, the last two years. So the split that, that Ryan and I made about three years ago was that we said Clio's gonna win on two tenets. We're gonna really execute on two <coughs> two fronts. One of those is product and the other is service. And at that time we said I'll focus on, on product and Ryan will focus on service. So Ryan will build out the customer success organization, which isn't just um, support, but it's engagement and it's referrals and it's you know trying to make sure that we've got this really really healthy customer population. And I would focus on on product, and that was the uh, the split we made at that point that helped us scale. But of course, scaling isn't as easy as just he and I deciding what our respective responsibilities are going to be. Uh, we needed to, to bring on uh, you know, a, a senior management team, which wasn't something we had up at that point. The senior management team was literally just Ryan and I. And, and over the course of the last three years, we brought on um, you know, senior people in sales and business development, uh, in product development, uh, and, and in marketing. And without, without those people kind of running their um, running their portions of the, the company, their, their business units effectively, there's no way we could have grown the way we, we have. So again, I think in terms of advice, I, I think that it's really, really important, probably earlier than you think you have to, to hire your your lieutenants that you can trust to take you know what might be just a very high level idea or concept and run with it and execute it. And it's tough, I think, as a founder to let go of those things because you're used to having your fingers and everything and at, at a certain point you just need to kind of let go and realize you're not going to be involved in every decision you're not going to necessarily know about what's going on um, even from the hiring side um, you know I I used to want to be directly involved in every hiring decision at the company because I wanted to make sure that employees fit what I thought was a you know Cleo's culture and and you know I had to to let go of that and trust people to make those decisions on 
on my behalf. So now I've got this somewhat strange experience of walking into the kitchen and meeting somebody for the first time that I had no idea we'd even hire. Uh, so it's uh, definitely been an adjustment period for, for me, but I, I think you know, part of scaling a company is just learning to, to let go of the right things. And you need to, of course, keep your, your hands on the really key things or what might be you know, new initiatives in the company to help them get off the ground. What would you say those new things are that you do need to keep hold of? For, um, so, one, one, so I mentioned hiring, and um, there was a couple of hires that we made about two years ago uh, on the sales side uh, that I remember Ryan and I weren't involved in at all, and we kind of stared at each other uh, when these people showed up in our office <laughs> and wondered uh, what hiring criteria were used, and um, decided at that point that one of us needs to be involved in at least what we called, what we now call the culture screen. So you, you know, hiring manager um, can run the hiring process all the way up to, you know, penciling an offer letter. But before that offer letter gets signed, one of Ryan or I needs to meet this person to make sure that, yeah, this is somebody that we want to go up for a drink with on a Friday night. And if they don't meet that criteria, um, you know, we'll we'll say. Sorry, the offer letter can't go out. The, the other things I think you need to keep a hand on are just the right level of high level uh, strategy items. You know, like if you're, uh, if you're executing on a new initiative, um, that's something you need to help get off the ground. You need to be involved um, at a deep level with all the key performance indicators for the company and know where something might be going awry and raise that up, you know, for, consideration or raise it up with the management team to, to be addressed. Um, and you can't you can't get abstracted too far away from from any of the details. I think you need to know what's going on in each department. You need to know what all the key initiatives are. Um, and so it's a real what I've found as a as a CEO is that striking that balance is is, is one of the biggest challenges of focusing on the top level strategy items but not letting some of the really important details go away, if that, uh, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. One more thing about hiring. Um, those first few key people that you said, the lieutenants, yeah. um, other than your brother, obviously, who was one of the first you hired, how did you choose those people? Where did you find them? And how did you know that they were going to be the people to lead your company into success it is now? Uh, every single one of them, um, with the exception of Kat, and one of our software developers were people that uh, came in through our network. So they're people that either Ryan and I knew and trusted, uh, or they were people that were referred into referred into us by uh, by people that we trusted as well. So I think you know people always talk about how important your network is and how important your connections are. And I think that's very true of getting involved in a startup as well. If you really want to get involved in a startup, make sure that you've got a strong network in that in that startup ecosystem because I think for almost every every key position we've hired for, um, with the exception, like I said, of a small handful of positions, um, applicants haven't come in through a, a job wanted ad. You know, it's, it's been an introduction or you know maybe one degree of separation, but a warm introduction with from somebody that can vouch for the person and say, you know, this is a solid addition for your team. And again, this is kind of a well-worn piece of startup advice, but I do really believe that your your first five or ten hires really define the company, and they're going to be the people that set the standard for what your future hires will be. So getting those, I, I think we're, you know, a combination of very picky uh, and very lucky. We're selective, but we're, in, in the end, I think very lucky with the quality of people we ended up with in those first five positions. Awesome. Okay. Um, so then, what about your second round of funding? What happened after that? I know you guys you had a pretty big round in New York, right? Yeah, that's right. How so so we, well, we raised our Series A. It was, uh, like I said, a million dollars uh, in uh, late 2008. And we're able to build the company um, from, you know, at that point, four people up to a company of, you know, probably 15 or 20 people when we were raising the uh, uh, the Series B, and we we had seen enough success in the experiments we were running on the sales and marketing side that we knew this was something we needed to to double down on. We saw what we thought was a very clear 
greenfield opportunity to go after the uh, go after the market, the uh, the legal uh, the legal market uh, for practice management and time billing was uh, in the cloud space, at least in the web-based software space, completely unexploited. We were first to market; it was our opportunity to lose, and we decided we're going to go after this space uh, more aggressively than um, than anyone else. And like I said, we've been doing a number of relatively small-scale experiments uh, in the interim, uh, proving out customer acquisition channels, uh, you know, building out our product development team, and we were able to, uh, in a much better funding environment in 2011, go out and raise uh, $6 million as part of our, our Series B. And, uh, How did you get there? Uh, so, in the Series B, I was, you know, it, it shows you what a difference uh, both the economic climate and the amount of traction you have makes. You know, the Series A, we were, you know, fighting like crazy to get a meeting with one VC. Uh, our Series B, we were, um, we had so much inbound interest that we, we wouldn't even return some uh, some calls, and we were we were able, you know, in in closing the round to get to a situation where we had multiple term sheets coming in due to the amount of, of demand. So it completely flipped from you know a, a, an investor's market to a, a company market. We were able to get really good terms uh, and close the Series B on a pretty a pretty tight timeline. It was really not difficult at all to raise that, that Series B. Uh, so it, you know again, I think people, people look at a large round and think it's got to be so hard to raise that much money. But if you have enough traction, it's probably a lot easier to raise that $6 million than it is your first $100,000. Yeah. What advice would you have for companies who are trying to find their first round of money in this climate versus obviously 2008 was not the best, but what about now? In this climate? I, I still think that, you know, for for early stage companies that are looking to get their first round of financing, it's still tough. It's it's not that it's a difficult market, but getting people to trust you and get their checkbook out and invest in any idea is still still difficult. So I think you know the, the advice would be go out and go out and make sure you're building a um, a network in the startup community that can make introductions to investors and other. Uh, well, other investors, not just other investors, but talk to other startup founders, talk to uh, people like me, frankly, you know, that, that have gone through the fundraising process and, you know, we, we've raised money from two funds, basically, at Clio, but I've talked to, over the course of the last four or five years, probably upwards of 50 VC firms. And if you talk to me about your idea, I would probably be able to say, well, at least two or three of the firms I've talked to would be interested in that kind of a, a play, and you know I'd be able to make an introduction. Anyone that's raised money in the past, it's probably a very similar situation to me, where they'd have that network and uh, be able to make uh, make introductions. Um, you know, in Vancouver, uh, get to know Morris because he knows every everybody, and uh, um, if he's not interested in investing your deck idea, he like probably knows somebody, probably knows somebody who would be. <laughs> Uh, you know, be interested in um, uh, in investing in your your company as well. So, I think that you know, again, just like the hiring comments I made, it's all about who you know. Do not do not email your business plan into Sequoia. You know, like they, they all have email addresses and they all have some ability for you to kind of pitch them over email and just don't even waste your time with it. Uh, in terms of other things, I found that didn't work. I didn't find that. Pitching at the angel forum type events worked either, um, and I think those events were kind of a um, kind of a bad deal in that you know they charge money to entrepreneurs to don't pitch at the events pitch. as well. It's don't pay to pitch exactly, and I, I think the temptation is there if you're having a hard time raising money. And you know, again, in 2008, I think Ryan and I were just up against the ropes and decided to bite the bullet and paid the. It wasn't a, a huge amount of money, but it's still a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. That when you're that stage, it's it's a lot of money. 
Uh, so I, again, I think that if you have a, a network you can leverage, you can completely forego those events and even if you spend your money on those events, I'm not convinced they work. When did you move the company to Vancouver and why? Uh, so Ryan and I, you know, we, we actually worked remotely over the course of the first probably uh, two and a half years of the company and grew the team to uh, to about 10 people or so that were working uh, distributed in both um, Vancouver, uh, Powell River, Edmonton, and uh, New Brunswick, which is where our, our customer support league was located. And we felt that when we hit 10 people, um, you know, we, we'd been, we found all the great ways to work remotely. And if you read, you know, what 37 Signals writes about working remotely and so on, I really agree with with a lot of what they say. You can build really effective, productive remote teams. But I think the one thing that's very, very difficult to create with a distributed team is culture, and uh, especially when you're trying to do with with Clear, we're trying to build a you know a, a product with world class design. And it's really hard to build a great product without a whiteboard and a room that everyone can get into. So we realized that at around 10 people, what had been working in a distributed fashion wasn't going to scale up to 100 people. And that we had to, at some point, start building a center of gravity for the company. And we decided on Vancouver for a couple of reasons. One, we built Clio originally with the support of the Law Society of British Columbia. So we, we felt that we had you know, our partner that originally was involved in the development of Clio, kind of in our in our corner in Vancouver. Uh, we we felt that the development, that the talent base, both for development and the design, uh, was excellent in Vancouver. Uh, there's excellent development uh, talent in Edmonton, but I think most designers leave Edmonton really quickly. Um, so we we wanted a combination of both skill sets in Vancouver, or in, where we located our HQ. And we also realized that, um, you know, you, and I've discovered in the meantime that it's, it's challenging to find uh, these people in Vancouver, even in Vancouver, but if you're looking for really s s senior executives to help bring on the company down the road when you're at the kind of stage we're at right now, you need to be in one of, you know, the top couple of centers in, in Canada to do that, uh, in Toronto or Vancouver, and, uh, um, you know, we, we decided that, that Vancouver Fit, check the most boxes for us in terms of those qualities, and that's a great place to live. So, all of those things, um, you know, had us consolidate the company in Vancouver. We, uh, we we picked up some cheap office space, started hiring uh, some people, kind of put out an open invite to all of our team members to come out and join us in Vancouver. But we still kept all of our remote staff that were willing to move and. And now we've built up the Vancouver office to a point where I think there's, um, you know, 60, 60 some odd employees working out of that office, and uh, about 15 or 20 people are still remote. Did you ever consider going down to say Palo Alto or San Francisco, or why not? Yeah, so we we did, and you know, one of the one of the things that kind of filtered our or, or really swayed our decision making on what VCs we'd have discussions with was whether they were a VC that believed we could build a big important company in Vancouver. A lot of them there is either the you know explicit or implied expectation that we would relocate the company to um, to the valley if they made an investment. And I, I think we, we always felt that we can build Clio in Vancouver. There's certain kinds of companies I think that you need to build in the Bay Area. But a company like Clio, we can build in Vancouver. I think we can, you know, we saw all the things we um, we were benefiting in, in, in Canada in general, in Vancouver in particular. One being, uh, we have 100% retention in our engineering organization. So every single software developer or designer that has joined Clio has been with us and stayed with us. You compare that with you know, the, the valley and engineers are jumping from one shiny startup to the next uh, just because they can make, you know, another, either they think that their, you know, upside potential is higher or they can make five or $10,000 more a year there. There's very little to no loyalty 
um, in the valley when you're looking at the, the equipment landscape. So we, we said, why would we move ourselves down to a, a place where we'd be fighting for talent with companies like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Amazon? I think we're now fighting with all of those companies here in Vancouver, but um, <laughs> five years ago at least we weren't. And, and uh, yeah, the, the loyalty of employees that we see in Vancouver is just something I don't think you'd be able to replicate in the Valley. Um, and the cost basis is way lower in Vancouver as well. When we talked to VCs, when we were doing our Series B round and showed them how far we were able to take a company on a million dollars, they were, they were blown away. I mean, they they looked at our um, our spend and said, you know, a, a company in the if you were in the valley, you would have burned through that in a quarter or a fifth of the time that you have up here. So it's you're able to stretch your investment dollars a lot further here than you are in the valley as well. And again, we you know we 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 liked the fact that we were building. Um, you know, what we hope will be a great company and a large company in Canada. We wanted to stay in Canada, so. Awesome. Uh, last question. Yep. Was there ever a point in this whole journey that you were just for sure the company was going to fail? And if so, what, what pushed you past that? Um, so, no. That's a yeah. uh, <laughs> <Very good. laughs> kind of boring answer to the question. But uh, I, I don't, I think we've always had a lot of faith that, um, that this is this is going to explode. It, it is exploding, and we've never felt that there was uh, you know any kind of existential risk to the company. It's it's been we've been we've been lucky in that we've always been you know well financed enough and not not running close enough to the the red that we're worried about making the payroll or you know needing to you know, take second mortgages out on our house or anything. So it's uh, it's been you know a really fun ride, and we've. I think Ryan and I have always had confidence that the company's going to succeed. If you had been at that point, would you still have kept that faith and that confidence? I think you you have to. Uh, you know, if, if you're if you're a startup founder, if you're an entrepreneur, I think you just need to uh, em embrace risk and find a way to get through it. And I, I don't think there's any startup founder that would even become a startup founder if they kind of gave up prematurely. That being said, I, I think there are situations where you need to see the the writing on the wall and s see if an idea is not working and decide to reboot it or change it. Um, you know, to, we, we we're never worried the company was going to fail, but to give you an example of where we had to uh, to make a real um, kind of change in strategy was uh, we we originally thought that we could leverage our relationship with the Law Society of British Columbia and get them to market Clio. This was in the very beginning when we first had our, our commercial product ready to start selling to customers. We thought our go-to-market strategy would be leverage our relationship with the Law Society of British Columbia, get all sorts of lawyers in BC paying us money, then maybe go to Ontario, work with uh, the Law Society there, get a whole bunch of Ontario-based users, and then push down to the United States. And we saw that the, the Law Society was just not able to, I think it was more of just a, um, it was in their, in their DNA, or not in their DNA, to market a product. They didn't know how to market or promote a product to their membership. And they saw it almost as a, a potential conflict of interest. And you know, Ryan and I had really been pushing this and trying to, and it felt like pushing rope. But we were trying to say, like, look, we developed this product with you guys. We developed it with your cooperation. Aren't you going to help us sell to your members? And at that point, we were pretty short on cash and really needing to get some growth going. And we, we realized, you know, this this tack is going to work. So we went down to the United States and, and went to the ABA Tech Show there, which is the big legal technology show in the States, and had this just tremendous reception down there and immediately just changed our strategy from what was prior to going to that trade show, let's win Canada and then push down to the States to a strategy of who cares about Canada, <laughs> we're going to focus on the US uh, and just take whatever we can get in Canada. 
uh, and that's still our approach, right? You know, we, we, we really don't care about Canada as a, um, as a market for our software. We love building Clio here, but we, we realize that we're not going to get the cooperation of the law societies and so on uh, to market Clio to their memberships at least. And we, um, you know, we, we appreciate, of course, the fact that we've got Canadian customers, but we've viewed those customers as kind of collateral to the customers we gain through our international, our U.S. expansion effort. So I think that's an example of a point where if we were too set in our business plan um, and too narrow-minded in how we were going to market, we would have failed at that point. We would have been hung, we would have been standing at the LSPC's doorstep hoping for them to help us with marketing while we ran out of cash and went out of business. And we realized it wasn't working and had to to change your strategy. So I, I think that willingness to evolve your strategy, to react to market conditions, and to be dynamic is is what will help you explore the you know the solution space that will help your company explode. But it's um, sometimes easier said than done when you've got you know, short amounts of cash on hand. Of course. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. We'll just let everyone know if you guys want to have some questions. Uh, and any questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. How were you able to find the first thousand customers? What uh, channel did you leverage? So I, I, you know, our, our first customers, we uh, we launched a beta in uh, about six months before we planned on officially launching the product, and we gave those customers free access to the software over the beta period. But we always made it clear to them that we wanted them to be our first paying customers when they uh, when they got involved in the product. The other thing we did in our in our kind of beta process that I think was actually a really a good a good approach in retrospect was the fact that we did we didn't open up the beta to anyone that wanted to sign up for the beta. We opened up the beta to customers that um, well we let anyone submit their name to the beta, but to get into the beta. We required the customers uh, agree to have um, a one-on-one -on -one web demo with one of Ryan or myself, and we showed them the software and how it worked and what it did. And they were able to. This had two benefits. One was that it uh, it kind of set a bit of a step-in cost to the beta customers. The last thing you want in a beta is a thousand people that come in and kick the tires and then leave right away. You want people that are kind of engaged and and kind of really put the software through its paces, excuse me, over the course of weeks and months. So that that step in cost, I think, really filtered out the tire kickers and made sure we had engaged customers in the beta. Uh, the second thing it did uh, was it it gave the customers a lightweight way of giving us feedback early in the beta process. So even before we got through the web demo. They were heaping on feature now feature requests, right? So the first beta of Clio didn't have a billing function. We didn't think it needed billing, um, which shows you how clueless you can be when you're kind of searching around for for product market fit. But we at that point didn't think that uh, Clio needed to have billing. We thought it could just integrate with another product. And our customers, even before we got through that web demo, would say, "No, you you need billing." So. That didn't get us to our first thousand customers, but the beta did get us to probably our first hundred paying customers. And you know, I think a hundred is a threshold. I think if you can find a hundred people to pay you for something, you're going to get to a thousand, and you're going to get to ten thousand. You know, I, I think getting to a hundred is the toughest hundred customers you'll ever find. Ten can be a fluke, right? Ten can just be your close relatives. Getting to a hundred, though, you know, is a real Tough slog, uh, but if you found a big enough market to get to 100 paying customers, I think a thousand and beyond will come pretty easy. But how did you how did you land the beta customers? The beta customers, we um, we made a really big deal about launching the beta. We launched the beta at the ABA Tech Show, so that's actually the show I was talking about when we decided the reception we got down there was like, wow, we need to focus on the U.S. market. So we we launched our beta down at the ABA Tech Show. So we got. You know, I think a lot of people think about going to trade shows either as like kind of an old-fashioned idea um, or a place where you'd launch a product officially. We launched our beta at a trade show, and I actually think it was tremendously effective to do it down there. All of the thought leaders in the legal technology space were at this trade show. 
So they wrote about the fact that we were launching a beta in all of the big magazines that went out to the legal uh, industry. Uh, we got bloggers covering the beta. Uh, we hired a PR firm, so I talked about PR. Uh, our PR agent did a tremendous job of getting the fact that we were launching this beta out in, in the channels. And that just drove all this inbound interest. So it was a pretty, I think, routine formula, but I think if you execute on it well, you'll, you'll get those early beta customers uh, without too much of a challenge. Thanks, great question. Yeah. Obviously, right now you're an experienced entrepreneur, but you're still not at the real top level, like the other level. Do you have any mentors? Or would you, who do I see? Um, do you mean now or when I was now. starting out? Or either before or now. Um, I have people I look up to, but I, I wouldn't actually say that I've got... You don't hang out with them? Any, any mentors? No, no. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I certainly have entrepreneurs that I would look up to and you know try to not necessarily even emulate but just look at what they've done really well in terms of you know thinking big, thinking long term are two of the the traits I really like in great CEOs, great entrepreneurs and um, two that you know are front of mind in, in terms of uh, people that um, I, I think are, are just phenomenal in that regard would be Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos. So both of those guys I think are Obviously, insanely talented entrepreneurs, but more than more than that, they're both entrepreneurs that think on the time scale of decades when they're thinking about the kind of work, the impact they want their work to have, and that's something I try to always emulate. Is if there's something you can do in the short term, or if there's a short term benefit that you can, you know, parlay into something that will pay off in the long term, take that make that investment over taking advantage of a, a short-term gain. And I think those are two things that they've, um, they've done really well. But um, I've talked to a lot of people that um, have really sworn by having uh, mentors or coaches help them out. And um, I certainly had a lot of people that I went to for, for advice and so on, but I wouldn't necessarily say that I had uh, you know formal mentor over the, the course of the last five years. Hold up, question. Yep. Uh, nowadays, in the high tech startup field, uh, pivoting and uh, the lean approach are very popular. Do you have any comments with that? And in light of, it doesn't look like you did any pivoting. And uh, I don't know how lean your original product was. Or... So it's interesting you mentioned that the, when we were first building Clio, the, um, I read a book called Four Steps to the Epiphany. Uh, which is written by uh, Stephen Gary Blank, who is, I think, the, like, the philosophical um, originator of all of the lean startup ideas. Um, so that book was hugely transformational for me, and I'd encourage uh, you know, anyone that's interested in, um, in any of this lean stuff that I, I kind of think of it as the the new age version of what Stephen Gary Blank was talking about four years ago with the, the four steps to the epiphany. But um, that was a book that very much guided our initial product ideas. And we, I think we did build a lean, minimal viable product before we even had those terms, thanks to uh, four steps to the epiphany. Uh, Steve, in that book, um, Stephen talks about the fact that you you shouldn't be building a product like you know, people in a startup environment often think they're building a product but he says what you're trying to do in a startup is discover who your customers are and you know you're not doing product development you're doing customer development and you're trying to discover you know as, as you said you're trying to discover your first hundred customers if you can discover your first hundred customers uh, you'll have the tools you need to discover your next thousand customers so, great book, highly recommend it. Yep. Okay, uh, after changing gears in the strategy, going, going to the US, have you seen uh, interest for your products uh, be able to spill over to Canada? Have you seen? Oh yeah, yeah, so we do have, I, I didn't mean to be quite so flippant about Canada. We, we, 
we have about two and a half percent of our customers in Canada. Um, so it, it matters. It's an important source of our revenue, and we hope it will grow over time. Uh, but, but something I've, I've heard many entrepreneurs in, um, in Canada lament about is the fact that a lot of Canadian businesses, whether you're talking about um, the legal sector or the public sector or the private sector, is they're slower to adopt technology than their American counterparts. So if you're, if you're building a product that is in any way leading edge, and hopefully anyone that's in a startup is building stuff that's leading edge, Canada is the wrong place to be marketing that product. You know, they'll follow. It's almost like in the legal space, at least. It's almost as if they'll follow the lead of their U.S. counterparts once they see something really proven out and effective in the U.S. But they will not be the first ones to use it. And the time frame that are that that at least Canadian lawyers even acknowledge themselves to be lagging behind their U.S. counterparts is five years. They, they say they're five years behind really? technology. Clio's only been around for five years. <laughs> so think about that. You know, and, and I think even if you look at the relative adoption of Clio in the U.S. and Canada, the U.S. only has ten times more people than Canada, right? So they, you'd expect that Canada would have maybe a ten percent market share, or maybe ten percent of our revenues, rather than two and a half percent. All other things being equal. And I think that seven and a half percent difference is the conservatism and the slowness in adoption of technology that you see. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone. Oh, yeah, one more question. Hey, you mentioned you were first to took um, a SaaS-based solution, the legal space in the market. I was wondering if you had challenges with pricing um, and how to come up with the right pricing, because that's always a challenge when you are yeah, no. producing it. No, absolutely, good question. So I think um, your beta period is a great time to play around with pricing uh, because you can float pricing all the time and just see what the reaction from your customer base is. As soon as you have a published pricing page, you're kind of locked into that, unless you feel comfortable A-B testing your pricing, but that can turn out badly. Um, so what we what we did is, you know, at trade shows over the course of our beta period, even at tech show when we launched our beta, people would say, "This looks great. I love the sound of Clio. How much is it going to be?" And to one guy, we'd say it's going to be fifty dollars a month, and to the next guy, we'd say it's going to be a hundred dollars a month, and to the next guy, we'd say it's going to be twenty-five dollars per month. And we were just able to gauge literally hundreds of reactions to pricing, and we found at the end of that um, that kind of experiment phase. Uh, $50 a month was the one that, you know, seemed to hit, it was actually $49 a month, which is maybe an important dollar difference, but $49 a month seemed to be an important kind of psychological barrier, where as soon as we started talking about more than $50 or up, we were like, oh, I'm going to have to think really seriously about that, and your software better kick some serious ass. $49 and under, people were like, yeah, that's a you know, it's like discretionary spending. You wouldn't think about it. Just put your credit card down, no problem. So that's actually the pricing we set five years ago, and it's still the price we have today. And we probably have some headroom now, thanks to the you know more robust feature set and um, and so on. But um, yeah, take advantage of your your beta phase for for pricing experiments. Just a follow up question on the, on the pricing. Do you ever think in the beginning? To have a freebie model to get more traction, and yeah, like yeah. You know what? Or is the enterprise level, enterprise space, a little bit different than most other? No. So I, I wouldn't consider Clio an enterprise. Our place. So we, the, most of our customers are are solos. Are, this is actually one surprising characteristic of the the legal market. A lot of people think of legal as like yeah. an enterprise type market, but it's actually almost all people in firms of one to ten. Okay. And about 80% of the legal market are small firms, one to 10 lawyers. And the vast majority of our customers are like the one to five lawyer demographic. So, um, you know, we looked at the freemium model, and I think there's some success stories of the free, freemium model out there, but we just thought it's, it's hard to get right. I think it's just way easier to say, 
here's the product, here's the price. If it's a value to you, pay, pay the price. And the freemium model has, if you get it wrong, it can cost you a ton. You're either missing out on revenue you'd other, otherwise get, or you're supporting this huge base of, of free, freemium freeloaders on the product. It can, it can get very expensive. So there's success stories out there, but I would have you know, a very strong bias to just trying to find the price point that works and charging everybody for your product. If the product's of value to you, pay for it. And that's got a comforting simplicity to it. I'll uh, stick around as well. So if you guys have questions, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to answer them one-on-one -on -one as well. So um, thanks for your attention, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah.